Okay, good evening everyone. It's now about 10 after 7. It is January 25th, 2016 on Sound City Council. Robbie Burns Day apparently. Uh, who wants to recite some poetry? Kepke? No. O'Leary? No. McManaman? No. It's missing the A in the Mac apparently. Thomas? Richard, you're artistic. You must have some poetry. I'd love to drink some whiskey, Your Worship. <laughs> okay, let's get this meeting over with then. <laughs> Um, we went in camera to discuss uh, the Harbor Port assets uh, uh, issue for a few minutes at 6.30 and now we're starting the regular meeting uh, at number two. Well, that's us declaring that uh, moving into regular meeting. Any additional items? I'm going to start at the far end, Councillor Kepke. Thank you, Your Worship. I have uh, an announcement <coughs> regarding a new film festival, and I will let staff indicate what the other item is. Uh, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a weather report and a little burp on a local athlete. Thank you. A weather report? Hmm. Really nothing? Yes. No. Yep, yep. I, okay. I just uh, I have to report an apology for my telephone problems. Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a, uh, an announcement from the Community Waterfront Heritage Centre. Thank you. Anyone else down there? Staff? Ms. Coulter. Thank you. I have the minutes from the Canada 150th and Own Sound 160th Celebration Ad Hoc Committee from last week, January 21st. There is a time sensitive issue, so we've asked that those be brought forward. Okay, and I'll give everyone a bit of a brief update on um, Marine Club last weekend and boat show. Just uh, the neat things that people in Own Sound are doing. So disclosure, pecuniary interest, the general nature thereof. Anyone have anything to declare? Seeing none. Number five, confirmation of the minutes, the regular meeting of January 11th and January 19th. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor McManaman, that the minutes of the regular council meeting held on January the 11th, 2016, as printed, be adopted. And all in favor? It's carried. A second Thank you. set. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thomas, that the minutes of the special council meeting held on January 19th, 2016, as printed, be adopted. And all in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Number six, resolution moving council into committee of the whole. Moved by myself, uh, seconded by Councillor Gregg, that city council now go into committee of the whole to consider public meetings, deputations, public question period, Matters arising from correspondence, reports, matters tabled, motions for which notice was previously given, and other business. And all in favor? It is carried. Thank you. Let's move down to number seven in our agenda, which is a public meeting with regard to the 2016 budget. So we're seeking a motion. A motion first to adjourn the council meeting, according to this. I would move we adjourn the council meeting. Okay, Councilor Lemon is moved. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Now the declaration, and that one's mine, Carolyn? Yeah, okay. I hereby declare the public meeting open. This is a public meeting to <coughs> consider to adopt the adoption of uh, the proposed 2016 budget, including the operating and capital budgets. A brief presentation will be given by city staff. Following this, there will be an opportunity for residents to comment or ask questions. Your Worship, this is a public meeting to receive public comment. Notice of the public meeting regarding the proposed 2016 budget was published on January 4th, 2016 in accordance with the city's notice policy, which requires notice of an intention to adopt or amend a budget be provided at least two weeks prior to the enactment of any such bylaw. 
The uh, Director of Corporate Services has scheduled this public meeting to receive comments from the public, um, either orally or in writing. Um, I would ask those in attendance to sign the sign-in sheet for communication purposes. Personal information collected at this public meeting <clears throat> is collected under the authority of the Municipal Act 2001. The information collected will be used for purposes related to the proposed adoption of the 2016 operating and capital budget, which will form part of the public record. Any questions about the collection should be addressed to the deputy clerk. Uh, no written comments, <coughs> excuse me, or inquiries have been received by city staff prior to this meeting. Thank you. Um, at this point, the director of corporate services has an oral presentation. Welcome. Go ahead. Good evening, Your Worship, members of Council. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through the PowerPoint presentation and then take any questions. After that, I believe there's a staff report shortly after this in the regular agenda. The 2016 operating capital budget. So the purpose of tonight's meeting, we're in the public portion, we're going to go through this presentation. After that, uh, we will review the final draft of the 2016 operating and capital budgets. And there is a recommendation to direct staff to bring forward a bylaw at our next um, council meeting, accepting the 2016 budget as it is presented this evening. In the process to date, our budget process is an annual process. Right now we're working on reviewing the budget for last year. However, every summer and early fall, staff begin to plan the next year's budget. Operating budgets are carried forward and then adjustments are made to reflect current uh, service levels and any known changes. Staff will meet as a group to discuss um, potential and recommended staff or capital projects early in the fall as well. And then council meetings are held at three separate stages to review each component of the budget. And through this process, our first meeting was held in November. We focused mostly on the operating budget at that time. Our second meeting was December 4th, and that focused on capital as well as we reviewed operating again. And tonight represents the third meeting that we're having to review the final budget in the completed draft document. So just a highlight summary of some of the things that have changed in the budget. We're looking at an overall levy increase of 731,000 and this is roughly 3.03%. Some of the drivers um, creating this change are a dedicated increase of 1% to the capital budget. We've Increased waste management from the prior year by approximately $175,000, and that's as a result of going through the RFP process. There's a reduction in the OMPF funding of $155,000, and citywide we're looking at wage and benefit increases totaling $773,000. So this will be a combination of both um, statutory and um, negotiated wage increases, as well as some new positions. Offsetting those negative pressures, we do have a recognition of temporary savings of 195000 and a reduction of winter control costs that we posted at the last meeting, and that was 150000 Now, there certainly are other drivers in there as well that bring it to the 731000 overall increase. This pie chart just breaks down our operating expense by category, and excuse me, I do have my notes on a separate document here. Uh, wages and benefits are just over 50% of our total operating costs. Benefits currently cost the city about 27.5% of every dollar paid to a full-time employee and 30% to those entitled to a regular retirement age of 30 or 60, sorry. Um, and that is our police and fire unionized employees. Driving this cost for those benefits is the tiered OMERS pension costs. Materials and supplies shown on here at 18% is everything from our utility costs, insurance, to salt and sand and pens and paper. Major contract services making up the 11% pie there include waste management collection, transit, parking enforcement, as well as airport management and animal control. 7% for debenture payments is amounts for principal and interest payments that are on major capital projects that were debentured in prior years. And then net reserve transfers represents the amount going into reserves each year to stabilize spending and fund future capital. 
a large portion of the 11% there would be the surplus generated from our water and wastewater operations, which goes into reserves to fund the current year capital program. This next slide shows what our operating revenues are by type. So these are the sources of revenue that we use to fund our operating budget. 57% of that is taxation. 4% is grants. Um, our most significant grant including is the OMPF, but that would also include grants like Stewardship Ontario and other provincial and federal transfers. The white pie is amounts from other municipalities, and this would include the contribution from Gray County towards our winter control, as well as a significant portion of that will be the dispatch service revenue that's generated by police services. User fees are mostly water and wastewater charges, which are intended to fully recover the cost of those services, as well as uh, user fees such as transit fares, bag tags. And then other revenue includes everything from fines and penalty, permits and licenses, to donations and investment income. And finally, the last slide shows the total burden on the tax levy by division. This is the operating portion of the levy only. The OMPF has been entirely allocated to general and corporate, which sort of um, makes that seem like a very small portion of the pie at 1%. Corporate services is the 8%, 15% to community services, 22% to operations, 18% of our levy goes to fund fire, 31% to police, and then the remaining 5% goes to the art gallery and the library. And I was just speaking about this chart earlier with our chief. These represent all allocated costs to those departments. So not necessarily just the budgets they control, but for example, for police services, we're also allocating the cost of the facility and for other departments as well. And we are allocating uh, de debt payments based on the departments that incurred them in previous years. Also tonight, we will be looking at the capital budget. The capital budget has a dedicated tax increase of approximately 1%, and in addition to that, we are reallocating matured debenture payments from previous years. Some major capital projects included in this year's capital budget include the continuation of the wastewater treatment plant, the completion of 3rd Avenue West and 8th Street East, continuation of electrical upgrades at Harrison Park, significant erosion control and riverbank infrastructure repairs at Harrison Park, a new accessible washroom at Kelso Beach splash pad, the design and consultation for future renovations to City Hall, and the groundwork for the rehabilitation of the Inner Harbor and Public Park along First Avenue East. Also included in tonight's budgets are some of the changes that have taken place since we last met in December. And I've just highlighted them here. They're also highlighted in your staff report and in the capital budget anything that's a addition since the last meeting which represents a carry forward item from 2015 they are shown with a priority color of violet just to show that they were sort of pre-approved and carry forward so some of these changes that took place since the last meeting we reduced lottery revenue by 10,000 to reflect the fact that the downtown bingo hall is closing several days a week the waste management contract was increased by 25,000 to reflect an interpretation of the wording of the RFP proposals. Um, we've included the police services budget details, which we didn't have previously. Um, the distribution of council expenses changed slightly, but the bottom line remained the same. We've added the Canada 150 program at $8,000, and that is funded for reserves. That's the sort of planning stage for the actual program that will take place in 2017. There's some minor adjustment to the city's share of library costs, and this is due to the fact that we now have the known membership, so that impacts our overall um, contribution. There's the addition of the facility to the Kelso Beach splash pad. There's an increase to police services capital over what was presented to you in December. Additional budget added to 8th Street for the completion of that project and the inclusion of all the 2015 carry forward items that were not shown in the previous draft document. This final slide just basically summarizes how the average taxpayer's dollars would get spent in a year. So the average residential taxes in 2016 with a 2.19% combined increase, and that's with our known county increase and an estimated increase for the school boards at zero. 
Um, the total taxes for the average residential would be $3,405 in 2016. Of that amount, $681 goes to the county, $409 to the school, and $2,315 roughly is retained by the city. Of that $2,315, 992 go to your core services. And when I say that, I mean corporate services, operations, community services, general government and governance. Police and fire get 1,060, that's for operations. Library and gallery on an annual basis would get $97. And then $167 approximately would go towards all of our capital program. So that's it in a nutshell. If there's any questions or comments. <coughs> Thanks. The, the uh, council may have questions later when your report comes up, but for the public meeting portion, we'll go to the public. So if you want to get away from the microphone, we can you know, let someone else go near it. Thank you very much. Are there uh, any comments that members of the public wish to make at this meeting? If so, please come forward and state your name. I'd also ask that you provide your address to the deputy clerk for communication purposes. Anyone have any comments, any questions? Don't see anybody moving. It's just like the auction, going once, going twice, not sold, sold. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so now I declare that the public meeting is closed, given that no one's made any comments. And I believe we have a motion to reconvene the council meeting. Councillor Lemon, you had your hand up, I think. Sorry, I thought you did. Yes, I would move that we reconvene the uh, council meeting since we have other matters before us. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. We have no deputations uh, tonight. Public question period, anyone wish to ask us a question? Again, not seeing anybody moving, so. Um, correspondence received for which direction of council is required? None, unless there's any that's come up. Nope, keep, keep going, go ahead. Just wondering, Your Worship, if we could move the report on the budget forward at this time. Miss Allen, uh, there's a number of people here dealing with that. I'm just suggestion. Uh, what, what number is it? Number three. So 11A3, move it up now. Is anyone opposed? Okay, so we'll move that ahead. So, Ms. Allen, do you want to present your report to council that? Uh, it's probably going to be much the same. Certainly, I, I don't really think that there is anything in the report that wasn't highlighted or summarized in the presentation, other than clearly the uh, draft documents are attached. Okay, so questions from Council, Councillor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. I guess my first question, in the water budget, what water rates are we assuming? And, and are those, is this finalizing tonight or will those come forward later? What increase in water rates, I'm sorry, percentage-wise? I'd have to look into that, honestly. We, ha we don't finalize those rates until we do the user fee bylaw in May. So the rates would be set, I believe it's set at 2.5% is what I use to do the budget. However, once we have the actual rates, what that would impact overall is the annual surplus and the extra would be transferred to reserves. I'll come forward in May, though. I believe so. Okay. okay. Um, second question, uh, just in your report, you talk about street lights being reduced and then we're taking the money from the reserves. Could you just explain that? In the capital, yes. So the original amount that we had for police services capital was 120,000. That was increased to 141,000. So in order to keep the overall contribution to capital stable, um, we reduced the amount of tax funding that was going towards street lights and took that money from the street lights reserve. And so the overall capital contribution for the year has not changed from what you saw in December. Um, the question about 8th Street, and you have uh, 
we've it, that, that budget or debentures increased by 380. Maybe this question is better for the director of operations. But um, a final wrap up on 8th Street. Those two large projects we had, um, where we're at with them, where how we're going to fund them. We know there's overages there. Is that that'll be coming forward at a future time? Is that the intention? That's correct, Your Worship. Uh, once we get everything finalized. Uh, we'll bring that forward so council is fully informed as to as to the final disposition. Uh, I would point out uh, because the overage, uh, it was, I think we were all in, in the understanding that uh, we'd probably have to debenture some of it at least. Um, I would suggest to you that I've had con uh, conversation with the uh, director of corporate services, and that would be our intention to use debenturing only as an absolute last resort in order to. Uh, to uh, fund the overage. I would point out that overage is significantly better than first anticipated, or at least at this point it appears to be. That's correct. Um, we were through um, some, some uh, deliberate actions that were taken on, on uh, Third Avenue. We were actually able to bring that project in significantly below budget. Uh, in an effort to attempt to offset some of the overages on 8th Street. Um, but uh, neither project is finalized and won't be until, um, I'm going to say, late spring or early summer. So uh, we won't have a, a final number for Council's consideration until that time. Okay. And last question, and since the police chief's here, it's about the police budget. I'm just scrolling to it here. Um, you're looking at a significant increase in the budget for revenue from dispatch service and is that and my question is is that uh, no new contracts or anticipation of new contracts those are signed new contracts they are so it's going up 400 or some odd thousand 404,000 440,000 something like yeah how those many are signed new, contracts. how many new is that just one new service or no that's two police services in gray county great okay great good news thank you good. thank you councillor lemon had his hand up Got answered. Uh, Deputy Mayor Wright. Yeah. I, I just have a question, and, and I apologize because I probably know the answer to this, but our write offs this year are extremely high. We're writing off 550000 Oh, I'm sorry. I should be asking you. 550000 okay. it looks to me like um, appeal tax, right? Appeal taxes and write offs. Is that right? That is correct, and actually our write-offs in 2015, although that is close to what we budgeted, were significantly higher than that. That's that's 2%. There are several properties that had assessment um, review board decisions that went back, I believe, eight years. So we're recognizing write-offs since 2009. If I could, Your Worship. Yep. Certainly the increase in the budget as well over the last I'm going to say three or four years has been we've had much more uptake on our community improvement plan. We are promoting that plan. Uh, it's good for the city. It gets community improvement. But uh, how that works is we refund people's taxes to help them pay for the work they've done, usually around brownfields. So that's why that number is significantly more than it was four or five years ago. The community improvement plan <laughs> refunds are also captured in that budget number. It used to be around a quarter million dollars. It's now, as you say, 550. But it's a great plan. It's one I think the city promotes as much as we can. And the fact it's had great uptake means it's working. So, but. Um. Well, okay, I, I guess my point is we're looking at a 3% a tax increase. And without, if we didn't have that 550,000, we'd be looking at a half a percent increase. I mean, it just. Or 1% increase. Correct, but the way the system works, uh, MPAC gives everyone their assessment notice and they, t you know, they value your property. You certainly have the right and many people uh, use that right to appeal their assessment and, and there's a process to go through that and yes. MPAC uh, is certainly kept busy answering those appeals. But I'm going to say, um, you know, that, that is a number we've certainly been using each and every year. So it is a budget number, but it's a pretty hard number in, in reality as well. People have the right to appeal, and, and they can be successful. Yeah, just a, a side note here. I think it's time we asked uh, someone from Impact to come to a council meeting and talk about assessments and those sorts of things in the city. Thank you. 
Councillor Lemon. The unfortunate thing is, uh, in the sense that the uh, tax appeals, we have no control over what that amount is going to be. It depends on how it's ruled, and it's an uncontrollable expense. It's like snow removal. You don't know what it's going to be at the beginning. At this point in the year, you have no idea. And I believe we're going through another impact uh, reassessment, are we not? I believe that's for next budget process. And at that point, we're probably going to have an even bigger number of appeals because people whose taxes go up tend to appeal. Very few people appeal their taxes and saying they're too low. At least nobody I know. Chip, the, the four-year uh, reassessment process has certainly assisted in those huge uh, dips and valleys in reassessment because it's a four-year period. Um, they may appeal, but the, the impact to the city isn't as great because it only goes up a quarter. So that has helped in that number. But absolutely, uh, people have the right to appeal. People do take advantage of that. And if you feel your assessment is not right, certainly you should appeal it. Is that it for now, Councillor Lemon? Covers it? You're, you're, you're done? Yeah. Okay. Others, uh, Councillor Dodd? Thank you, Your Worship. I would just uh, move the recommendation. Okay, so adopting the budget. Is there more questions? There is. There we go. It's not a question, just, an <clears throat> just a comment for the public in the capital budget. If this budget passes, uh, asphalt resurfacing is at uh, 382000 I believe last year was 100000 so it's almost quadrupled in this year's budget. So that's, well, we have a long way to go in <clears throat> asphalt resurfacing. This certainly is a good first step. I just wanted to highlight. So that'll get us down to the 50-year plan? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I wouldn't go quite that far. But Versus the 100-year plan? <laughs> it's a lot better than it was last year. That's, uh, Thank you. We're making progress. Councilor Greg. Comment. Thank you, Mayor Bai. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, in relation to the airport, we, uh, will well, we should see minutes coming forward that showed a very strong 2015 for fuel sales. And they are up 42%. Um, how is that um, portrayed in the budget here? Or do you use those, those numbers in the uh, 2016 budget? Maybe a tricky question, but um, I'm just, you know. We do try to or reflect historical fuel sales and the cost of fuel. We have a markup of, I believe, 1.25 on the cost of fuel at the airport when we sell it. So those, that would be the markup that we reflect in the budget as well. We wouldn't have known year-end results for 2015 at the time that we did this budget. So I would say it's closer to reflect 2014 operations than the current year. Oh, I'll wait for the, the director. Mr. Beck, um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we tend to be fairly conservative uh, in terms of fuel sales because for every one year it's up, there's probably two or three that are, are down. It's, it tends to be very volatile. So we, uh, we are very cautious in terms of how much revenue we assume. Uh, and, and the, uh, the uh, revenue over expense is actually quite small uh, as a consequence. Anything further? I uh, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, last meeting I said uh, I couldn't support anything over 3%. Uh, so as a matter of principle, I vote against the recommendation. Uh, but I'll do so knowing that, you know, we have expended a lot of money this year into the airport for some capital upgrades. And uh, they've had a positive year on fuel sales, which could negate that. So while I will vote against the recommendation, I'll do so knowing that um, it could very easily be under 3% as well. Uh, and I also believe that any budget vote should be a recorded vote, so I'll ask for a vote of record on this too, please. Okay, Carolyn, it's a recorded vote. Uh, other comments? I just uh, will note that I went through newspaper, uh, online newspapers across the province to try and look at some of our comparable uh, municipalities. Um, not all of these municipalities are done at this point, but I think some of them are. And uh, based on the, the latest uh, media reports, we saw Soggy Shores the other day, which aren't done, are sitting at 4.7% uh, blended. 
and what I understand to be a 7.63% increase uh, municipal, they plan to draw off the reserves to get below that, which uh, Meaford did that for a few years and it, it didn't get them a long way in the long run. Brockville is sitting at 1.79%. Uh, that's not blended because they're a single tier. Uh, they drew down on the reserves to get there. Stratford was at 4.09%, uh, much higher than us, and uh, net at 272, so we're at 219, so we're in better shape. Roy is at 2.9 blended, so we're in better shape there. Uh, Orangeville is almost the same at 2.22, and Cornwall is at 2.84 blended. Um, Collingwood was uh, 2.06, 2.06, not blended, with 1.5% uh, growth, and I th think blended, I, I, I think it was 1.76 approximately, so they're ahead of us, but otherwise we seem to be right in the middle of the pile with other municipalities and, uh, and better than many that we're often compared to, so that's my comments. Um, any other comments? So Councillor Dodd has moved the recommendation. Um, okay, go ahead. I just want to make one comment, and it was really interesting because I, I read this in the paper and I cut it out, and it was I was reading something about municipal taxes, and it says here, Oliver Wendell Holmes, a former U.S. Supreme Court justice, said taxes are the price we pay for a civilized environment. So... As much as we hate taxes going up, just think of what would happen if we didn't collect taxes in the city. Sorry, and who said it? Oliver Wendell Holmes. Oh, so it wasn't Robbie Burns. No, it wasn't, unfortunately. It was an American. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, recorded vote. Uh, Councillor Dodd. In favor. Uh, Councillor Gregg. Against. Councillor Kepke. In favor. Councillor Lemon. In favor. Councillor McManaman. In favor. Councillor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Thomas. In favor. Deputy Mayor Wright. In favor. Uh, Mayor Body. In favor. It's total eight, four, one against. Uh, motion is carried. Good. Thank you. Again, Ms. Allen, thank you. Go back to 11A1, which is the report from communications advisor with, with regard to uh, host of the 2021 Canada Summer Games. Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. As you'll know, uh, a letter was received at the end of last year inviting the city to host the 2021 uh, Canada Summer Games. Um, you requested a little bit more information, so we talked to the ministry, went back and got a little bit uh, more information. Now, some of it is interesting, the fact that we don't need a stadium per se to host this, and there's a, a few other options, including hosting this with uh, perhaps an adjoining uh, municipality. Um, the numbers, however, at the end of the day are a little high, and so that's why we wanted to come back to you with this. Uh, the cost to get our bid in the door is $30,000. Uh, there's an $880,000 fee after that to get the rights to the games. And then there's about a $3 million expectation that the municipality would have to put up just to uh, put on the games. Now, that is matched in different uh, ratios with the federal and provincial government. Um, them both putting in about 13 or $10 million each or thereabouts. So uh, now, having said that, none of that really comes back to the municipality or the city. Some of that will go to hotels, restaurants, and that sort of thing. Um, there is, there, they've thrown wonderful numbers around the Sherbrooke Games in 2013. They estimated about $165 million went back to the community. Of course, that doesn't go back to the city, so I don't think we'll see it in our coffers. So um, it's just something to consider. So at the end of the day, uh, the bid submission deadline is at the beginning of February is when it opens. Um, the, the three options are basically to go ahead, put in a bid, put in a bid in conjunction with the, a side municipality, let it be Collingwood or something like that, and that we host a few of the games, or uh, we simply politely decline. Councillor Gregg. Uh, 
thank you very much for the report. And I think when you uh, get a chance to look at the numbers on this sporting opportunity and cultural asset, it's a little bit expensive for our community. Um, and I agree. I think that some of those numbers provided to uh, to us to look at are a little bit optimistic uh, as well. Um, so I would uh, just uh, motion that we uh, perhaps politely decline. So receive the report and not go any further? Yes. Any other comments? Councillor Lemon. I have a question. Have we talked to Collingwood about the potential of the joint hosting? No. Because, yeah, I, I agree we can't afford it, but maybe with some partners we can, and with some of our neighboring municipalities perhaps, like uh, Georgian Bluffs, Meaford, uh, Town of Blue Mountains, and Collingwood, it might be a workable project right across the, the base of Georgian Bay. If I may, the other consideration is the fact that this is the summer games, and Owen Sound might be more inclined or more successful in, in a winter type of scenario. We do have some. We, yes. <laughs> Not that I've seen yet, but yes, apparently. We had it today. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think probably at that 880,000, even if you divide up four ways, you're still on for 220,000, which is a chunk of money. Yeah, that's quite concerning. And, and I think it was uh, 30 up front just to apply 10 <coughs> off the bat that, you know, is, 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 is gone. If so you apply, you don't get the 30 back. If you, you, if you win. If, yeah, you, you, if you don't get to a certain point where they come and evaluate your community, they do give you, I think, 10 of that 30 back. They're, it's very I'm generous. I'm going to call the question now in favor to uh, not move forward. That is carried. Thank you. Uh, 11A2, report from bylaw coordinator, revised 2016 uh, council and committee calendar. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, this report with the calendar in it um, has been revised based on your comments. Uh, the new uh, newly formed committees would meet as follows. Corporate services on the second Tuesday of the month, community services on the third Wednesday of the month, and operations on the fourth Thursday of the month. Um, if you have any further questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Councillor McManaman. Thank you, and, and uh, thanks to Mr. Smith for this, uh, this revision. I think it looks great. Um, the only question, and I can't recall if it was just myself and the city manager or if we had it with council, so I apologize. Those meeting dates at the end of July, the budget ones, did we discuss this with anyone else? I talked about moving, Councillor Kepi, you remember that? We talked about moving them I, to early July. That's correct, and that was my recollection. I was surprised to see them back in late July. Because okay. I thought it was the first two. Mr. Smith. Um, through your worship, these are projected dates. Um, the city manager and I discussed this. He's not entirely sure when uh, he will bring back um, the service review, the, the results of the service review. Um, so we're, we're sort of holding them as a placeholder for now. Uh, we expect to set a, a date or dates uh, later on in the year. So that can be amended uh, as we set those dates. That's okay. if, if um, do we want to move the placeholders to early July just in case? Does that, or does it matter? Mm -hmm. Might as well. So I would move, the, uh, so I'll move the adoption of this committee meeting schedule with the only change moving the uh, service review in July to the 5th and 6th, I think we said. Was it? No, I think it was 5th and 6th. 5th and 6th, yeah. You no, want, you. Not 5th, that's county council day. Oh, yeah. So why don't we leave them where they are right now? <laughs> because we're going to spend an hour trying to figure this out. Let's leave them where they are and then we can adjust them later. Agreed. Uh, move the committee uh, schedule as stated and uh, we'll uh, decide on that July service review when we get closer to it. Good, all in favor? That is carried, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Just did number three, number four, uh, community planner with regard to site plan approval. 
for 1725 10th Street East. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we have an application from the Residential Hospice of Gray Bruce for site plan approval for a new 18,000 and 500 square foot uh, hospice located on the south side of 10th Street East. So the site plan um, shows a new building as well as a covered vehicle drop-off area, 36 parking spaces including six accessible spaces, um, uh, uh, concrete walkway from the municipal sidewalk, um, there's a shared concrete patio as well as concrete patios for each of the patient rooms, um, and there's two-way uh, vehicle entrance egress at both sort of the east and west ends of the site. Council will recall in 2015 you approved uh, rezoning for this property that made way for this site plan and provided some direction with respect to fees. The property is designated residential and the uh, proposal conforms to the policies of the official plan subject to the conditions that are recommended. The property is zoned R3 with special provisions wh which permitted a long-term care facility which specifically included a residential hospice. The site plan does conform to the site and building regulations of the city's zoning bylaw. Um, today the site plan was presented to our accessibility advisory committee and that committee um, endorsed uh, they certainly appreciated the efforts that have been made in accommodating accessibility on the site plan and supported the staff recommendation with respect to certain elements including lighting, the accessible parking spaces, etc. The committee was very supportive of the application. Um, <clears throat> in terms of landscaping, um, the, the site is to be well landscaped. Uh, there is some question about the proximity of the trees along the street to the hydro lines and we've just made a condition that um, that will be worked out to the satisfaction of the manager of parks and open space uh, along with Hydro One. But overall the landscape plan uh, will create a, an attractive site. <clears throat> In terms of stormwater management, both our, the city's engineering division and the conservation authority have requested further information with respect to stormwater quality and quantity. I know um, our staff, uh, together with the consultant for the applicant and Grace Sobel, are working out those details. So there is a condition um, that deals with stormwater uh, management as a condition of approval. In terms of security, it's your normal practice on a site plan to require a security along with the site plan agreement. In the spirit of Council's resolution with respect to fees, we're asking that you provide some direction to us on the matter of that security for the site plan. Normally with the development, we hold that security when the site works are completed uh, based on an inspection by staff, the security is refunded. So in this case, um, we're asking you um, for your direction with respect to uh, the requirement for that security. So staff uh, recommend approval of the site plan subject to the conditions outlined in Appendix A um, and ask you for direction with respect to the security and that council authorize a bylaw allowing for the execution of that site plan agreement. Council McManaman, questions? No, Your Worship, I was just going to move the recommendation. <coughs> that we uh, approve the site plan uh, subject to conditions outlined and that we waive the normal security of $10,000. Okay, any other comments? Councillor Kepke. Uh, just a question, how many patient rooms are there? Through you, Your Worship, Mr. Lovell's in attendance, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand there are nine patient rooms. Good, other questions? What a night for a meeting, isn't it? I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Good. Carried. Excellent. Um, just to wait for a second. I assume the press want to uh, go and talk to Mr. Lovell about that one. That's kind of a big one. Oh, <laughs> 
I think he's covered there. Okay, so uh, number five is next, and it's the report from the community planner again for the technical report on Red Hawk development. Ms. Coulter, please. Thank you, Worship. This is the technical report on an application for official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and subdivision approval, uh, but the applicant is Red Hawk Construction Limited. Um, the, the site uh, development plan is on the screen in front of you. The purpose of this report is really to provide council with a description of the application applications and outline for you the policy framework which will provide you the context to consider these applications. In terms of the process to date, we did a pre-circulation with this applicant um, in 2014. Based on the comments provided through that process, a complete application was submitted by Red Hawk on October 22nd. Notice uh, of that complete application in accordance with the Planning Act was provided to the applicant on November 20th and then given to the members of the public on December 4th and 11. So we're at this point of the technical report to Council. On February 8th, uh, pro provided Council's direction tonight, uh, we'll have the public meeting and following that public meeting, uh, staff would bring back a report um, to you. I won't go into significant detail unless Council has questions this evening, um, but I, I would stress that all the information that has been submitted with the application is available on the City's website. There's an excellent summary of all the um, technical reports appended to Ms. Potter's uh, report, and um, I would encourage you to uh, just, just read those before the public meeting. So the property is um, on 8th Street East. It has about 600 meters of frontage on 8th Street. It's 62 acres in size and uh, combines three former properties. This property is within the Sydenham Heights planning area and at the time of the 2012 official plan update, this was an area really contemplated for <laughs> residential growth um, by that official plan. So the development uh, which is shown on the screen, 8th Street is running along the top. There's a new road, uh, Road A, that runs sort of um, parallel to the Telfer Creek tributary which kind of forms the uh, east side and then Street B which would link with future development in the future to the west. So we have along the street frontage, you'll see that large block. There would be 265 at apartment type units in that area. And then there's 37 detached dwellings pr proposed along Street A, 65 townhouses, and um, the block, there's a block for stormwater management, and, um, and then there would be a block along the, the Telfer Creek that would be transferred as hazard floodplain lands to the city of Owen Sound. So in terms of next steps, Your Worship, we'll have a, a full presentation uh, the night of the public meeting on February 8th. The applicant will be here that evening as well. Uh, we'll give information um, to, to those members of the public who may be attending and uh, would be, I'd be happy to answer any questions Council may have. So questions? Councilor McManaman? Thank you. Well, my first question, is this the time to ask questions or should we wait till the, the public meeting? I'd be pleased to take any questions. I may not be able to answer okay. them all tonight, but it may give us uh, some information on which to focus areas of our comments for the public meeting. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but um, <laughs> so just a couple questions. Is it intended that the, this would be a lit intersection, or do we know that yet? Uh, through uh, your, by traffic lights, I mean, sorry. Through your worship, it's not proposed to be a signalized intersection at this time. Uh, secondly, then, there's no, I know we talked, it talks about parkland dedication, but there's no actual parkland in this uh, site plan? There's no, I can't, didn't see any. There is a passive stormwater management area, but as per our official plan policies, it wouldn't count as parkland. The, um, the hazard land would come to the city, but again, hazard lands aren't considered parkland. Um, based on the proposal from the developer, they're proposing cash in lieu of parkland. Uh, third question, that's Street B, and I think you've answered this. Uh, well, we never know what, what development may or may not happen to the west. It's intended that that Street B could possibly be a through road at some future date. It, that's the um, um, idea at this point. 
that that's correct? That's correct, Your Worship. The, um, the secondary plan for Sydenham Heights provided a conceptual road layout, and I'm just looking for the, uh, the appendix that shows the secondary plan, but it is very much in keeping with the road uh, outline for that area. So somebody has to go first, uh, so this will sort of set the stage for the development of the lands to the west, but it is in keeping with our official plan. Okay, and last question. Um, so we have $150,000 in the budget this year for these, for some of the engineering. And is, is, am I right in saying it's anticipated the city would have to front end, I know it's estimates at this point, but a million and a half dollars? Is that roughly what we're looking at here? Through you, Your Worship, as you've mentioned, uh, there is money in the budget this year to undertake the environmental assessment. Um, relating to the extension of services required in this area, particularly the sanitary sewer from its current terminus at 16th Street East. Um, the official plan provides for a few different ways for servicing to happen, and um, one of the ways is the city front-ending and recovering those costs over time. So we are working on a land budget for the Sydenham Heights planning area, and I don't know um, if Mr. Becking has anything further to add in that regard. Not at this time, Your Worship. That's all. I'd be happy to move the uh, recommendation that we move to a public meeting on this. I think this is the, certainly in our, in, this new council, one of the most significant things we've, we could ever do. I, I've heard Councillor Thomas talk about stories in the 87, was it, when the hospital opened, or that area opened up and it was gonna be open for, you know, we were open for business in this area and not a whole lot's happened since then. One of the main reasons our water and sewer are not available there. This is the city, I say, taking a, uh, you know, I, uh, we're taking a, a big financial step here to try and get this area opened up to more development, so I'll be, I'd be happy to move to a public meeting. I think it's a very important topic. And thank you, Councillor. Larry was next. Thank you, Worship. Just had a couple of questions for Director of Community Service. Um, you're gonna have comments go to the public meeting on February the 8th. Is there anything on the negative side so far from residents in the area? You, Your Worship, we'll have a um, uh, when the agenda goes out for February 8th, any of the comments we've received will have uh, included in your packages and we'll be prepared to summarize those comments for you that evening. Um, so I, I would wait until maybe February 8th to comment on those. Okay, and, and I noticed the developers has uh, gone ahead with a phase one environmental study, which is moved into a, a phase two, is that, is that a problem? I know it's his, it, this has been his own decision just through due diligence, but does that, is that a problem in the future? Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, I think the developer, the city's pre-consultation comments given the historic use of these lands as agricultural rule uh, did not uh, request or require a um, environmental study um, the developers done that uh, on their own, you know, by their own choice. I think they're just doing their due diligence on the property. Okay, and just a comment. This is the biggest report I've ever seen. It was a great job by you and your staff. This is, this is incredible. Good job, thanks. Okay, we're gonna go to uh, Deputy Mayor Wright next. Thank you very much. You were talking about phase two. Would that be attachment B that's attached in our report? And if it is, I, I just have a, a question. Phase one looks like there's just the one entrance onto 8th Street. Oh, there's, there's that, that. How many entrances are, is there, is there the two entrances onto 8th Street shown there? Through you, Your Worship, and, and thank you uh, for putting attachment B up. So you'll see the multiple blocks out front. Um, there would be the main intersection at the new intersection of 8th Street and 20th Avenue, and then there would be an additional entrance from 8th Street into those blocks containing the multiple. So um, in total, there would be two entrances on 8th Street. Okay, now looking at the same, down when you go down to the bottom, there's a cul-de-sac. Is Would that cul-de-sac 
be open, would that open on to 6th Street? In the future, um, that's where it would be aligned to, you're correct. To open. Right. My, my concern, and this has been raised at county a number of times when we get, we get um, subdivisions and, and plans in, is that if anything happened on 8th Street, that that street was closed down, there would be no way for those people to get out of there. That there, there really needs to be an entrance on the, the uh, south side. On to, or onto 6th Street going west. There needs to be some way that if 8th Street is closed down and both entrances are blocked for whatever reason, we've had, we've had that happen in the city. We have places like that up on the East Hill that I'm aware of that only have one entrance out onto 7th Avenue, that if that entrance was blocked, it poses a, a significant problem. So in order to avoid things like that happening again, I'm just questioning whether or not when you do look at phase two, not now, but when you do look at phase two, you would look at something like that. Thank you, Worship. We'll make sure we highlight the findings of the traffic study uh, for council at the public meeting on the 8th. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Lemon was next. My first question is how far is that cul-de-sac from the existing 6th Street? It would be hundreds of meters away. So it's there's significant property that has to develop for that. The second question is, since this is a new area, uh, this is addressed, I guess, to yourself and to the Director of Operations, I'm assuming we are going to put storm scepters or require storm scepters or something to take the bad stuff out of the storm water. Are we going to be using Telford Creek uh, as a storm water function for this development? Through you, Your Worship, there is a stormwater management block uh, provided in the subdivision. Um, the, the water would be treated in terms of quality and quantity before it is outlet, but you're quite right, it would be outlet to the Telfer Creek. Thank you. And Councillor Kepke. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you to the Director, was I correct in hearing that Phase 1 would include an apartment building? Through your worship, there would be three apartment blocks or, and buildings along uh, the 8th Street frontage, I think, including 267 uh, units proposed at this time. Okay, so attachment A shows a block where an apartment would be, I, sort of a, an odd shape block, is that correct? That's right. So where's the parking for that? In, in doesn't show any parking right. to me in attachment A. So in the conceptual site plan attachment, um, you'll see th the buildings on the plan. Um, what the plan of subdivision would propose is the creation of those larger blocks. So then what would happen would, there would be a detailed site plan just like you saw for the hospice tonight. So as those buildings are proposed and phased in, there would be a detailed site plan that would come back to council for approval. So there would be the building and the parking on, on those sites uh, for those developments. Okay, and in attachment uh, B then, the conceptual plan, the parking I understand will be along the front. What are those three buildings or blocks? Are those apartments as well? The, right above the parking? Yes, right along so the street. Those, those are the buildings along the street and to the south or behind them is, are the parking areas. And then this other block as you go in, which is block 44, I think, is that an apartment too? Those are uh, cluster townhouses. They would be, sorry, the block, block 44, 44 is the stormwater management pond. Okay. Sorry, you. I gave my attachment B to the clerk today so she knew which okay. one to have on the screen so I don't have it. Okay, so thank I'm, you. Sorry. Okay, other questions, comments? I'm going to call Councillor McManaman's uh, motion, which was to um, approve the recommendation, which includes proceeding to a public meeting on February 6th, 8th. I'm trying to find it here in my, uh, oh, I'm giving up. Uh, 8th, all in favor? That is carried, thanks. 
Down to uh, number six, uh, Deputy Mayor Wright, anything to tell us about Gray County Council? Uh, no, I, I have nothing to report other than the fact that uh, Owen Sound has a representative back on the Board of Health. So uh, I will keep you posted on things that go on in the Board of Health. Good, thank you. Uh, 11B, consent agenda items. Your Worship, on the consent agenda this evening, there's a report from the community planner regarding comments on Meaford Crescent application B02-2016 with a recommendation to receive the report regarding comments to request notice of any further meetings or decision with respect to the application and to copy the community planner's report and council's resolution to Meaford and the County of Gray. Uh, there's also a report from the community planner regarding Meaford Committee of Adjustment consent applications B13 through to 15 for 2015, where there is no comment. There are planning notices with no report. Uh, there are minutes for receipt from the Owen Sound Municipal Nonprofit Housing Corporation and Owen Sound Housing Company, respectively, from meetings held on December 15. 2015. Uh, there are also minutes from Gray Sauble Conservation Authority, the full authority board of directors meeting held on November 25th, 2015. <clears throat> there is correspondence received, which is presented for the information of council, which is listed at item 11B8 of your agenda. Um, it in it also includes reference to final approvals issued for two business licenses, one to Donna Stewart to operate Ewin Weight Loss Studios of Owen Sound Limited at 845 10th Street West, Unit 2, and Miranda Smart, um, who obtained, obtained a change of ownership to operate Family Affair Hair Care at 340 10th Street East. Um, both those businesses are self-evident by their names. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Councillor uh, O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. Um, to the Director of Community Service, on the Meaford consent application, uh, just to be clear, these, are we at the 165 number with this, or? We were at 164 and now we're at 165 and we're at the max. Through your worship, I understand that we have 165 services allocated under that agreement. All of those are allocated. This consent and through the staff uh, in the municipality of Meaford, we understand that one of the allocations of the water service is being taken from an existing home that is serviced by a well and that uh, will not be connected, but rather the connection will be used to service uh, one of the severed lots. There is a communal, which means private. Um, a number of residences are on a, a, a private system. Those are all allocated a service, save and except the, the one uh, existing residence I've spoken of. Those are all going to be disconnected from that system and uh, connected in accordance with our agreement with that municipality. Right, so now that they're at the max, so they, those could never be reconnected without us knowing, and if they did, we would know. If there is a request for additional services beyond what that agreement provides, it would come back through this council, you're correct. Okay, thank you. Councilor McManaman. Thank you, and just, just to clarify, for, uh, thank you, Councilor O'Leary's question. Not all 165 are, are hooked up. They're allocated to specific properties. I believe that's correct, yeah. Um, so my question is, is along the same lines. The existing residents, the farm lot, will transfer its municipal water service. So I'm assuming we'll have some sort of legal documentation that takes that into account because, I mean, you can clearly see what will happen five years from now. They sell that property uh, and say, oh, we want to hook up too. And we said, no, you already used your service for this severed lot. You. Uh, you know that would be a, it's a much bigger discussion at that point so I'm just uh, I just want to make sure that it's you know that there's some paperwork here that uh, clearly states that they have transferred their service 
through your worship I would recommend then um, an addition to the recommendation by council and that you request um, uh, documentation of how that would be transferred in order that they not exceed the max allocation of 165 and I would move that your worship okay as an additional uh, additional um, part of the recommendation Stovo, what order do we want to do it um, perhaps we should just take that one out and um, move that one separately that might make it a bit simpler and is that number two on the uh, package yes. number, one number one on the one. package okay so we'll just hold on to that for a second if I can get someone to uh, move to receive a lot of uh, items 11 B 2 to 11 B 8 in the consent agenda and to let's just do that so Councillor Lemon is moving that we receive items 11B2 to 11B8. <clears throat> All in favor? That is carried. Now with regard to the recommendation in 11B1, separate that. Councillor McManaman. Conditional that we ask for documentation of the transferred service. And anyone, any discussion? All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. I'm going to uh, jump back to um, uh, what have we got? Municipal nonprofit housing and housing company meeting December 15th. Councilor McManaman, you're there. Uh, I, uh, actually, I, I wasn't there, and Councilor Lemon was ill at the time as well. So I, I would just the only real comment is they approved a housing needs study. Um, you know, they, the, these companies want to move forward with building more affordable housing. First step of that to get any sort of government grants is to prove that there's an actual need. So this housing needs study uh, demonstrates what the need is, and um, and how it might be filled, basically. And and I just wondered to, to Mr. Ritchie, we had talked about the housing people coming, uh, the housing company representatives coming. Are they still planning on coming to a council meeting? Do your worship, yes, they are. We're just trying to arrive at a date that suits their convenience. But I believe it is March is the last. Uh, date that I'd heard that uh, the chair and their manager could come. So yes, they are. Great, thank you. And that's all about the minutes, Your Worship. Good, thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. Next, I see two meetings of Grace Sable Conservation Authority, November 25th, December 9th. Anything there, Ms. Kepke, you want uh, to uh, highlight? Thank you, Your Worship. November 25th minutes um, basically dealt with the budget and, and we've seen that. Um, also, there was a request from the Tom Thompson Grail, Rail Group, Trail Group. Um, they were asking for a waiver of fees, but that was denied based on the reasons identified in the minutes. Um, and uh, there's a, an event that's planned to take place September 17, 2016, on the Inglis Falls Road, and it's called the Brack Classic Hill Climb, which is uh, cars and motorcycles driving up the hill at Inglis Falls, which should be quite an exciting event and lots of activity around there at that time. Um, with respect to the December minutes, um, in there they further discussed the hill climb and um, there was also a request for illumination of the falls on Saturdays in the month of January from 6 till 9 p.m., but it was felt that that certainly wasn't a, an active time at Inglis Falls and didn't see the value of the illumination during those times. So, uh, other than that, at this point, I think that's it. Thank you. Good, thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. I uh, note that we have correspondence in there, and there's one piece of correspondence that I just want to uh, reference. We received something from the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care and Chief Medical Officer with regard to uh, fluoridation. And so the province sent the municipalities a letter encouraging them not to um, withdraw fluoridation from water, which I wish the provincial government would just take responsibility for it and, uh, and make the decision that they seem to think is appropriate. We've also received correspondence, uh, everyone on council, encouraging us to withdraw or end remove fluoridation from water uh, right now and to come to a public meeting in Guelph to uh, learn more about it. 
under the Fluoridation Act, there's two sections. Section two is uh, that you, section two sub one says that you may put fluoridation in water. Um, the municipality may decide to do that. Subsection two of section two says that where there is a vote and the vote passes to put fluoridation in, then the municipality shall put fluoridation in. We don't have the option. We've got to put it in once it passes that vote. Then you go to section three and sub one of section three says that a municipality may remove or quit um, uh, fluoridating water and that's, that's in the case that where we voluntarily put it in. Where we didn't voluntarily put it in, which we didn't in 1965, there was a vote. Um, then we have to have a vote and we shall end fluoridation if the majority of voters tell us that we must and that we can't unless they tell us that we must. It was, uh, there was a vote in 1997 and again in 2014. In both cases, the uh, public voted to leave fluoridation in the water, instructed us to leave it in. Therefore, we cannot pass a bylaw to remove fluoridation from the water until there's another vote, which uh, potentially isn't going to happen until the next election. So just so that's clear, uh, I had to answer that twice to the same person uh, one night to try and explain it. And it's it's kind of complicated, but. Anyway, I wish the province would take responsibility for it if, if they want to tell us how to do it, but, or encourage us how to do it. Anyway, that's my wine for the night. Uh, I think we devoted in everything here, didn't we? So we're down to 11C, minutes of boards and committees for approval. So that's uh, Recreation and Parks Advisory Committee from January 14th. Who's gonna present those? Councilor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. Uh, it was a brief meeting dealing with our ice allocation policy. Uh, the previous meeting, we'd heard a deputation from uh, a couple of groups, and this was just to uh, wrap up the yearly review. Um, uh, some of the groups had asked that we we have a, a part of the policy is they have to take a certain amount of prime and a certain amount of non-prime to try and balance it out, and basically to uh, to help with the uh, the bottom line. Um, the, some interesting stats out of here, the, um, the net operational costs of the rec center are about $265,000. The Bayshore is 577000 for a total of both facilities costing $843,000. Um, and that's after revenue, 843. So with that kind of number, the committee could not recommend that we remove the non-prime requirement from from user groups. Um, and the only other comments I'd make, some, some, some interesting stats uh, continue to be that um, for minor sports, 64% of kids on average come from Own Sound, 19% from Georgian Bluffs, and 10% from Meaford with the remaining 10 coming from other areas. Just an interesting, that stat has been around for a long time and it's very stable. Then. So it's remained consistent 60, no 20, 60 from Own Sound, 20 from Georgian Bluffs, 10 from Meaford, 10 from everywhere else. That's that's pretty well standard. And the last point would be there are minor sports subsidies, so the amount we subsidize to have minor sports groups, uh, and we all know that's only one cost of doing business, that 843 is another one, uh, was $112,000. Uh, that's the subsidy we uh, pr uh, provided in 2014, so. And that's just for ice? Uh, that's for all minor sports. All minor sports. So any minor sports pay gets a, a break on the adult rate, what we, we would charge uh, adult user groups, so. Um, so with that, the only other major change to the uh, last minute ice policy is working well and we're making uh, uh, quite a bit of money off that. The only other thing is we've been reviewing this yearly since 2009. It is, was felt by the committee that we are, have worked out all the uh, sort of bugs in the system and we're, it's, it's fairly administrative now. Uh, so we're, they're suggesting we only review it every three years, which, so that's the, uh, um, so those are the men's worship, uh, just approving that policy with those, that change and I would move adoption of the minutes. Questions, anybody? Uh, so, so within that three year period, if something changes, there's nothing to stop us from bringing it back right. before that. It's just that it's automatically reviewed right. after three that, years. Uh, there's still a part of the policy at any time if somebody has a dispute, there's something they disagree with one of the users, that would come forward to the committee. This was just the, uh, every year we were having a yearly review of the actual policy. It was felt that we're kind of, we've got it right where we want it and uh, if someone still has a problem, they can still come forward. 
but the policy itself will be every three years. Good. Thank you. So that, any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. So we've uh, approved those minutes. 11D is minutes from closed session of council uh, meeting held on January 11th, 2016. Go ahead, uh, Councilor Kepler. Uh, Your Worship, I'll move uh, approval of the minutes of the January 11th, 2016 closed session minutes. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. 12. Other business. I think uh, if I uh, may go to staff first, Ms. Coulter had something on uh, the minutes of the 150th. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, sent out to you today and uh, on your desk this evening are the minutes uh, from last Thursday, January 21st meeting of the Canada 150 on Sound 160. Uh, Councillor Kepke is the chair of that committee and I think is prepared to present those minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, this may end up being a bit of a tag team between um, the communications advisor and the director and myself. Um, the minutes we're dealing with that were held on January 21st have a few time sensitive issues in them. Uh, the first being a letter to the Minister of Canadian Heritage and this is respecting a royal tour um, that we're requesting come to the city um, during the Canada 150, Owen Sound 160th. I don't know if we need to elaborate further by the communications advisor or will we just looking for direction? Go ahead. Nothing is official yet. We're, we're betting that there is going to be a royal tour in 2017 and word is that it may be Prince Charles and Camilla. And if that's the case, regardless of whoever it is, that we'd still like them to be here uh, or drop by. There's so many things happening in Owen Sound next year that we think it would be very appropriate. And that's, that's the reason behind the letter and the urgency that royal visits uh, take about a year to plan. So the sooner we can get this out, the better. So, so that was, uh, we're trying to get our dibs in there early. So uh, this, the second item in the first recommendation is uh, payment of uh, fee to the Water's Edge Film, sorry, Water's Edge Festival and Events. And this is um, for grant writing to support the Ontario 150 tour. And that is a tour of uh, Royal Navy ships, if I'm correct, direct, Royal Canadian ships, if the director can elaborate on that. Um, no, I, I think uh, the group is the same group that brought the um, Tall Ships Festival here. Um, because of their experience, they've selected Own Sound as a port in 2017. Um, the committee and council had previously approved going forward, indicating our interest. Um, this moves that forward. Uh, we would be expending some money to support that group in preparing an application. Uh, for funding. We would certainly benefit from any funds um, that they would receive. Um, and with that as well, on that portion of the report, we're also asking that a tall ship still be requested to attend. Um, we're still reaching out there for anything to highlight our harbour. Um, back to the first recommendation, um, there was a letter presented to the city regarding the Municipal Code of Arms and the registration of that with the Canadian Heraldic Authority. And if I could ask the communications advisor to maybe comment on that, please. Um, over the course of the history of Owen Sound, none of our coat of arms have, have, have actually been officially registered with the Canadian Heraldic Authority. There was one in 19, I can't remember the first date, whatever it is on the sheets there, 1920? and then they're 1966. Neither of those have been officially registered. There's nothing wrong with them, of course. Uh, the uh, person representing the First Nations, we might want to speak with the local <coughs> groups if they want to maintain that figure, or if we want to uh, reinvent it entirely and even go to the community and, and uh, petition the community, talk to people if they want a new coat of arms for 2017. It would take about a year for the for the heraldic authority to do. Um, there are some s subsequent charges associated with that. 
probably in the range of two to three thousand dollars for the actual coat of arms, and then the cost of doing an official flag for the city after that point in time, and and uh, some incidental charges, I guess, was letterhead and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if it's something the city is interested in doing. It's an interesting the fact that for as long as Owen Sound has been around, none of the coat of arms have actually been official. So um, the the committee was feeling that maybe 2017 would be a great time to launch a, a new coat of arms if the city chose to make a change in that regard or uh, keep the same one and get it registered, that kind of thing. Um, okay, th thank you. And then the, the last bit on there is uh, launching 2017 with the New Year's levy by the mayor and a uh, great way to start off our celebration year. So. Um, I don't know if there's anything else in the report that I need to highlight or the minutes that I need to highlight if the director thinks I've covered everything. I think that's a, an excellent summary. We will be moving forward with the city's application to the Canada 150 fund to support the, uh, the celebrations in Own Sound with the community partners that uh, came mm -hmm. to the public meeting in December and more of them that have been identified from the committee. So staff will be working on that. And on that note, I'll just move that the minutes be approved. If there's further questions, we can address them. I, I think uh, Deputy Mayor Wright has a question. I do have a question, and it comes under your other business. Um, the um, associated costs for the Marine Memorial and plaques, you have down 100000 100, to $150,000. Um, we have not approved the, that plaque yet. We approved in principle, but we didn't approve any funding for that, so, right? Well, actually, we're not asking the city for any dollars. We're looking for a trillium and other funds, and we have already started to get money. And uh, it, the project cannot go ahead. It's actually 120, 100 to 120,000. If it's, it says 150, that's a misprint. But uh, the, uh, we're not looking for any city tax dollars at all with this. That's all money from outside and from donations and from trilling. Okay, I think that was what we had suggested. Councillor O'Leary. Just on that though, like I, I had the feeling that, that we already had that money, like is this guaranteed money that we have? Because I'm just wondering if this, I mean, if we don't have this money for sure, maybe it shouldn't be in the letter that we're sending out. Like are we gonna get this for sure? Well, I think we've got a very, very good chance because it includes Aboriginal, it includes Black, it includes White, it's heritage, and uh, the last uh, project that, uh, like this that went to Trillium received uh, a special award for outstanding work, and I've already been in touch with Trillium. They know it's coming, and uh, the, the fact that we've already had a real winner on our hands is going to sit well when we go to Trillium. Councillor Gregg. Thanks, everybody. I don't think, I was a little bit surprised to see it in there because we haven't had any dollar value legitimately come through the committee. So it, it's a little bit, while there may be uh, in the long run, the funds are there and the, th those totals may be valid. It, it's a lot of conjecture right now. So, uh, but committee hasn't seen any hard, hard facts. Um, it's, it's quite premature, so. Um, uh, I, was, I was asked for an estimate, yeah. and uh, I based it on the previous project, and I used the hard numbers from it. <laughs> you're, you're. My, my, you, you say you've already raised money? We are expecting uh, two checks now uh, that... Uh, they could total as high as 23,000. And we will be giving them to Wayne as soon as we get them. Uh, and how's that work? If the project doesn't go through, these people get their money back? That is correct. Uh, 
um, but hopefully it all will be well and we will get it. This allows us to do expanded things by getting outside funding. And uh, we're going after about another uh, 30 or 40,000 at least, I hope. So Mr. Ritchie, do we have a policy in this? Should we be accepting funds for a project that hasn't been passed yet? Or should we be receiving pledges that when it passes, do, do we have some kind of, do we normally hold money for a project that hasn't been approved or? Through you, Your Worship, we don't normally, but we have in the past. I can think of one that we were <coughs> collecting pledges for and, and the project subsequently never did go and we still have those in our reserve funds. So it's not something we'd, we normally do. We have done it. I, I would certainly, uh, in discussion with Councillor Lemon, I would, I would uh, personally take the checks, speak to the donors to make sure they understood the arrangement and that we both understood the arrangement. If we issue a donation receipt for tax purposes, the money cannot go back. If they put it forward as a pledge at this time, I would probably deposit it, hold it until such time as the, the project did officially go ahead, in which case I would then change that from a pledge to a donation. So as, as long as we're very careful going in, everybody understands, I, I think we could do this. Not normal procedure, Your Worship, but as I say, we have done it in the past on one specific project. Should we have some kind of written procedure so it's really clear? This makes me really nervous. Not, not for something like this, Your Worship. No, we don't. Should we have? I wouldn't I, I, envision I can this just, being you're, you're telling practice. me that we're holding money that we've taken for pledges in the past. It didn't go through. We're still sitting on the money. That's not a good thing. In my mind, if people have donated money for something and we're still sitting on it, right. we need to have some kind of policy or plan in place of how we're going to deal with this. If all of a sudden you're getting 200 here, 500 there, 1,000 here, and it starts to accumulate and, and it doesn't get done, what do we do? Um, you know, I think we want to make sure that we have all the money up front or all the money pledged, whichever, that we know that we've got enough money that it's, uh, that we're not halfway in with accumulated funds and feel that we have to go ahead because we've accepted this money and, and we're on the hook for the other X percentage. I, I just think we need to have some kind of policy that we know what we're doing in this and uh, how the money's collected and, and where it's going and how it's being held. I, I, I think this is dangerous. Um, it certainly comes with some, some uh, unorthodox methods, I suppose, Your Worship. I, I think based on what I have uh, so far seen in reports, this project probably hinges on the Trillium funding. I think that's probably fair. Mm -hmm. So I, I would think as soon as the Trillium application is either rejected or accepted, I do think that is probably the goal point for this particular project. So um, I'm not sure, I could certainly work with Councillor Lemon with his pledges at this time to say perhaps they hold back on officially giving us the money and the Trillium rejection or acceptance of that grant will spur everything to a go, if, if Council would feel more comfortable that way. Uh, going to Councillor O'Leary. Through you, your, your Worship, uh, to Councillor Lemon. So it, when, at what point do you order these plaques? Like, you, you'll we know 100% you have We the will money. have the money, before we do spend any funds, we will have the money in place. Before you order, before That's you correct. order the plaques. Okay, and the well, same with the memorial. Uh, like, for instance, the naked ship, if we get specific money for it, right. then that maybe can go ahead uh, this summer. Right. So we should be okay then because we've already, we've, we've made a point as a council that we approve this as long as it doesn't cost the city any money. That's, that was in the motion that we, that we passed in the beginning. So as long as the money is there, then the plaques are going to be ordered. Otherwise, the only thing I was worried about is ordering the plaques and then, uh, by the way, we, we're 75,000 short and we need money. We cannot expend any money we don't have. Or, I mean, the trillion money comes in in two dollops. Right. And once we know we've got it and if they say, okay, you're going to have 80,000, we will know we've got 80,000 and we can only expend that. And that's what we did with the Black History Care, and we only spent the money we actually had. Okay. So, Mr. Ritchie, can we actually order something for 100 or $150,000 without approval of council, even though we've approved it in principle? Is that a spending thing that we're going to, that will come back to council no matter what? Absolutely, Your Worship. It isn't in the budget, 
and certainly I believe my authority is up to 100,000. I can guarantee you I won't be signing that PO and, and so without being in the budget, it cannot happen. Just one other point of clarification. The actual location for the memorial when that comes in will come back before council. The design of the, council, uh, of the memorial will have to be uh, uh, approved by the Art and Public Spaces Committee, which means it comes back to council. We're using city lands in what, for part of this. That has to come back to council. So everything comes back to council. It's just that we've got to get moving on, on getting money because it's money that's going to drive it. Okay, I'm going to go to, uh, thank you. I'm going to go to Deputy Mayor Wright next, and then I think Councillor Thomas wanted to uh, comment. I think anyone else? Well, I'm, I'm just, this whole thing just sounds airy fairy to me, quite frankly. It's all on supposes. And the other thing is, uh, pledges are, are very dangerous. I mean, we've had a situation where we accepted pledges, and all of the pledges did not get paid, and the city was on the hook. So I, I just, um, I find this very difficult. And I also don't like that the city is asking for money if it was, it was, is, is, if it was, it just isn't right with me. That's all I can say. Councillor Thomas. Well, I can't help but feel we're being a little bit premature with this discussion here tonight. In any case, we did pass a motion allowing Councillor Lemon to go ahead and try and put something together and bring it back to us. He has not brought us anything. It's a comment in here, but there's no motion attached to it, and he's not asking us for any money. You know, if, if it's a big concern, let's just take other business out of those minutes. Uh, so the reference is deleted. But, you know, I think we've got to give Councillor Lemon and his group a fair chance to put together a proposal and bring it back to Council, rather than, you know, having the discussion prematurely and dooming it from the start. And that's all I'll say about that. A Thank you. proposal is different, and I agree with you. A proposal needs to come back. Hit your button and say it. Deputy Mayor Wright is responding there. Say a proposal needs to come back. This, this yeah. isn't a proposal. This is just telling us that it's what the cost is going to be. This is not a proposal. Okay. Um, Councillor Kepke, anything else in these minutes? Any questions? Councillor McManaman. I thank you, Your Worship. I just had one, uh, more of a comment on the coat of arms discussion, uh, a caution. Um, 2017 is supposed to be uh, a big event and we're having lots of things go on. I just would hate to see that sidelined by something that could, in my mind, be somewhat controversial. Uh, if we're going to redesign our coat of arms, I just worry about that. Um, um, something that's been here since 1920, 1967, and then we're going to, uh, you know, ask for submissions. I, I just, I, I'm not saying I'm opposed to it, I'm saying a word of caution that that might not be as simple as it sort of sounds. So uh, uh, that's all it is for the committee members. Uh, it was just a comment, that's all. It could be a contest and we would pick somebody very much arm's length to be the judges. Well, that's what, <laughs> that's what I'd be very much afraid of. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Um, if I could ask the communications advisor to let council know the process on redesigning the coat of arms. Um, perhaps Mr. Uh, Parker is going to indicate the recommendation is that a report would come back outlining the process to develop a new coat of arms. So um, that's what the committee is recommending council approve. So we're not there yet we're going next step would be to look at that process good and and further to that your worship uh and council is that there's no obligation to, to do a new one even we could you you could go with the existing one and simply have it officially registered perhaps polished up a little bit um and just maintain the existing one uh officially at that point in time but certainly i'll, I'll come back with i'll talk to the heraldic authority and get more information good thank you just to add though my understanding is it's not we who design it it's the heraldic association right right all righty so um councillor kepke you're moving approval of the uh, minutes from canada 150th from january 21st all in favor that is carried thanks councillor kepke you had uh, two things 
Oh, my, was that was my them. second. <laughs> the first thing is asking people to save the date of April 28th. Uh, the Grace Alba Conservation Foundation is launching an annual event entitled Earth Film Festival, which will be taking place at the Roxy, um, and grade four and five students will be entertained in the afternoon with the Disney film entitled The Earth, and then there will be an evening performance which will feature a series of short films, and the feature presentation film is entitled Mile, Mile and a Half, which follows a portion of the John Muir Trail. So that's going to be something that's going to be great to attend. Tickets will be available at the Roxy once we get things rolling in a week or two, and they'll be $22, April 28th. Thank you. Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. I watch a lot of uh, CNN, and I want to talk about the weather tonight because all weekend I watched reports from Philadelphia and Baltimore and New York and New Jersey, and every reporter, the visibility was, you could see for miles. And this monster storm was so bad and the accumulations were terrible. And after the weekend's all said and done, they didn't get the accumulation that we got with our storm two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And really made it sound look good, I think. And I just thought I'd mention that because like Washington is shut down like everything, schools, everything for the whole week until they get things under control. And uh, I'm just glad that we just have less than a handful of people that complain about our winter control, uh, especially after seeing that. Uh, second thing, I want to mention uh, Larissa Yerkew, who has, um, she's been on quite a roll in the downhill skiing. Uh, the TSN heading on the weekend was, Yerkew puts Canada back on the map at World Championships. Uh, she's earned three medals in a row now. She had a silver in Austria, a bronze in France and another silver this past weekend on Saturday in Italy. And she's now the only Canadian competing in World Cup downhill full time. Uh, she went into the past weekend in Italy uh, ranked number four in the world. And she's from Owen Sound. Uh, I just think this is, uh, it's so exciting. Like she is, I don't know anything about downhill skiing but I do know the commitment and the work ethic this lady has to have to be at this level. She's just, um, not to mention the courage that she's got to go back up that mountain after blowing her knee out in, uh, I think it was 2009. So big shout out to um, not just Larissa, but her family too. And uh, go team Larissa. Thank you, Worship. Good, thank you. Yeah, and the amazing part is not funded by Ski Canada has raised all her own funds in the off season as well as hiring coach and uh, and traveling and just an amazing uh, amazing kid adult I guess now uh, Deputy Mayor Wright. Thank you very much, Your Worship. I just um, unfortunately have got a phone problem at my home that will not be remedied before I make a big move, and so I am unavailable except through my cell phone, and I give you the number. Uh, it's 519-379-2610, and I apologize to people if they have left a message since last Friday. I have not received it. So you have to get a hold of me on my cell phone or by email or message, but I cannot use my 991 number until the 22nd of February. So that's why you didn't return any of my calls. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Thomas. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, I'd like to, uh, as with Councillor O'Leary, bring forward another Owen Sound success story. And uh, it revolves again around the Community Waterfront Heritage Center. Uh, some of you will remember that we nominated them for an award. And a letter was received through your office, Your Worship. Uh, I'm pleased to inform you that your nomination of the Community Waterfront Heritage Center has been selected by our external jury and the Ontario Heritage Trust Board of Directors to receive the Lieutenant Governor's Ontario Heritage Award for Excellence in Conservation. And I just want to give a big shout out to that group. They have done a wonderful job down at that museum. And, and, uh, and uh, for anyone who's interested, the award uh, will be uh, given on February 26th at 6 p.m. at Queen's Park. That's a Friday night at six o'clock at Queen's Park. And uh, again, just to that group, they've done a wonderful job and they richly deserve this award. Thank you. Thank you. 
just want to uh, cover a couple of things. I went with Georgian College, as did uh, Mr. Ritchie and uh, Mr. Furness, uh, to the Marine Industry uh, Conference, um, Marine Club. Um, we met with, of course, uh, Georgian College itself. They give a report every year to the Marine Industry about their educational uh, um, systems and plans and uh, hear from the Minister of Transportation federally that comes in and tells them all the changes that are going on and what's going to be expected in training. Um, S Steve Furness wrote down all the information and I wished I'd grabbed it this afternoon, but this college has one of only three uh, simulators of, of certain things uh, up there. It's a very, very, very world leading world-class uh, training facility with the, with the um, simulators that they have. And you know, we, we see it, we take it for granted in a sense, but it was uh, kind of neat to hear what everyone else uh, had to say about it. Uh, um, also, there's a big dinner which three students uh, from Georgian College were honored for being the top of their class in engineering, navigation, and first year, second year. Um, for the second year in a row, it's interesting. Kids go into that college that are kids. They're pretty young. And after a year or so, when they win these awards and, and you meet them, they're very mature. They uh, have been out on ships already. And um, they really represent the, the, the college and our city well when they go out. They're uh, really, really neat people to uh, chat with and, uh, and, and be able to see them get these awards. Uh, we did meet with some other port type people, uh, some shipping industry people, and asked a gazillion questions about uh, harbor divestiture and harbor use, and um, got some ideas and some, some hints and some suggestions from people that have been through divestiture program before on how they did it and uh, learned quite a bit. On the Saturday, instead of coming straight home after in the morning, we went over to the boat show and joined the Sydenham Sportsman's uh, Club, who of course are selling tickets for their boat, which is a big fundraiser for their conservation work. Um, they seed something like 150,000 fish every year, which is amazing. Um, I don't know how many tickets we sold, an awful lot. Talked to a lot of people uh, that have been to the Derby or coming to the Derby, would like to come to the Derby. Um, people that have retired to Meaford, which they had retired to on Sound. It's a very, very good experience, very busy day, talked to a lot of people, and it was great going out and supporting uh, Sydenham Sportsman's Club because they hit 17 to 20 different boat shows and uh, shows representing on Sound all over the province and hand out our flyers and hand out summer folk flyers and do a lot to uh, be the face of, of the city at uh, at boat shows and sportsman shows and things. So a uh, big shout out to them for what they do. Thanks. <coughs> um, I think that's it for other business. And I'll move that the committee rise and report. Thank you, all in favor. That is carried. <coughs> uh, resolution adopting. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thomas, that the action taken in Committee of the Whole in considering public meetings, deputations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports, matters tabled, motions for which notice was previously <coughs> given, and other business be confirmed by this Council. All in favour? That is carried. Uh, notice of motions. Seeing none. New business by resolution. There's no new business. Bylaws. Carolyn, do you want to? <coughs> uh, thank you, Your Worship. There are 10 bylaws on tonight's agenda. One bylaw to confirm the business of the meeting. One bylaw to adopt a revised emergency management program and emergency response plan. One bylaw to continue or establish boards and committees and appoint members to them. One bylaw to reaffirm the city's designations under the Municipal Freedom Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, one bylaw to amend accountability and transparency policies, one bylaw to appoint specially appointed bylaw enforcement officers at the Harry Lumley Bayshore Community Centre, one bylaw to adopt the ICE allocation policy, CS17, 
approved two bylaws to execute agreements already authorized by City Council for a facade and structural improvement agreement with Hall Ridge Holdings for 832, 834, and 840 Second Avenue East, and a facility use agreement for the Josh Olenek Sick Shot Road Hockey Tournament, and finally a bylaw to provide for an interim tax levy for 2016. A question first from uh, Deputy Mayor Wright. I have a question on uh, bylaw number uh, 17F, and it's to do with the bylaw enforcement officers at the Bayshore. These same people, uh, I guess I'm asking if through you, Your Worship, Jeff, these same people, do they not do bylaws at the um, at the Julie MacArthur? Uh, through your worship, the only uh, location, the only authorized location of enforcement that they are being appointed to um, is the Bayshore at this time. And is there any bylaw enforcement up at the Julie MacArthur Recreation Centre? The um, parking bylaws, so things like um, accessible parking and uh, parking in a fire route at the Julie MacArthur Regional Rec Centre, uh, they can be enforced by our bylaw enforcement officer or any police officer. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, move the uh, bylaws. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Gregg, that bylaw numbers 2016-03-456-7-8-9-10, 11 and 12 be passed and enacted. 2016-01 be passed and enacted. And all in favor, that is carried. That completes our business for tonight. We are adjourned at uh, 9.55.